Welcome to Oyate Today. Oyate in Lakota means people. Brought to you by Native Sun News Today. Hi, welcome to Oyate Today. I'm your host, Richie Richards. Oyate Today is produced by Tim and Jackie Gallego. Tim is an enrolled member of the Oglala Sioux Tribe. Our guest tonight, our very special guest tonight, is Tamara Miyasato, Learning Specialist for Technology and Innovation in Education. Thank you so much for being here. We've been hearing a lot of good things about you on our program, so I'm glad to have you on our show tonight. So thank you. <laughs> Definitely. And um, Tamara, we'll get into your work here, but tell us a little bit about yourself and some of your bio and background information, please. Oh, sure. Well, as you mentioned, I work for uh, Technology and Innovation in Education, otherwise known as TAI. Um, so I'm a learning specialist there. Uh, prior to um, joining Thai, I was a high school English teacher at Pine Ridge uh, School. Awesome. Yeah, so I taught um, sophomore English. Um, so I have my uh, master's degree um, from Black Hill State University in secondary education, and I am currently pursuing my doctorate at the University of South Dakota in educational leadership. Wow. So I like to combine you know, my education and then my experience with my undergraduate degree from the University of Notre Dame in film and television. So Sounds like you're very busy. Thank yeah. you for stopping by the Oyate <laughs> Today Show, definitely. Um, where did you grow up then? Well, um, it's an interesting question. I always say that I'm from Flandreau and Pine Ridge. Mm -hmm. um, my family and I were enrolled at Flandreau and you know, I spent my formative years there, but I also grew up um, on the Pine Ridge and graduated from Red Cloud Indian School awesome. back in the day. So I always say I'm between both reses. <laughs> That's good. And then how long have you been in Rapid City? Um, I think I've been in Rapid City now for about the past three years because when I took the job at Thai, I, I left Pine Ridge. and came to Rapid City to be closer to my mom and to really spread the work and grow the work that I was doing in my classroom at Pine Ridge School. I met your mother, Mona. She's awesome. She is. She yeah, is. Awesome. She guides my work. That's awesome. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about your work now. Um, tell me about cultural proficiency and equity. What is this exactly? Because this is where you're kind of specializing in now. So what is this yeah. exactly? Well, cultural proficiency, it's kind of like this buzzword in education. And so it's making its rounds here in South Dakota. The, the textbook version or definition of cultural proficiency is really, it's a mindset or a worldview uh, for an individual or a collective organization where they um, are really able to be skilled in cultural competency. They're um, able to uh, describe, respond to, and plan for issues that arise in diverse settings. Sure. Um, for me, it's it's really about the practices and policies that an organization has mm -hmm. that really ensures equity, and that means providing equal and equitable access to everyone, and especially marginalized communities and voices. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really about um, again providing opportunity and having that mindset to do that. Do you think Rapid City is a good I guess a good place for this then? Oh, I think it's definitely needed in Rapid City. Um, I think that in Rapid City we have a very unique opportunity to really lead, you know, in terms of education, um, our schools in the area to lead in this kind of work. I really came into understanding uh, this work uh, through the work of a colleague of mine. Her name is Rosia Cozy, and she is a uh, diversity um, coordinator for the Howard County Public Schools outside of Baltimore, Maryland. And so really, you know, her work has informed mine. So she's a little bit more, you know, at a more macro level because they have, you know, extreme diversity in yes. and around Baltimore. Um, so I really think about, you know, what could that do for our community here in Western South Dakota? And so again, we can be leaders in that. Uh, because of um, our demographics here in South Dakota and because of my um, cultural reference points um, as a Dakota woman and Lakota, um, I really approach cultural proficiency from that cultural perspective of um, O Dakota or Wo Lakota to live in a good way. And so um, when I do the cultural proficiency work, it's really aligned to the Wo Ope Shakoni. Um, the Wo'ope Shakoni, or the seven laws or virtues of the Lakota, um, sure. 
was um, what I used in my classroom. Mm -hmm. And so um, my mom actually was the one who started using the virtues in her class um, when she was a teacher at Pine Ridge School. Mm -hmm. She used the virtues for everything, for classroom management, but also integrating you know, universal virtues in the content that she taught her students. I don't want to interrupt you, but what are some of those virtues then? Sure. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, um, Just so well, Open Shakoin uh, directly translates to uh, seven laws, mm -hmm. um, and that's Virgil Kilstraight um, from Medicine Root District outside of Kyle, his translation of that. Mm -hmm. um, but some of them are Wawayu um, Oniha, to respect and to honor, Wachante uh, Oganake, to help, to share, to be generous. Sure. humility, to, to be humble. So those are three of the seven. Mm -hmm. But um, it was really, you know, set up in a good way already um, to be a nice framework to create uh, an environment that's inclusive, that's welcoming, that's honoring um, the individual, mm -hmm. honoring their diversity and their own experiences, which really is the heart of cultural proficiency work. Mm -hmm. It seems non judgmental. Very much very so. Very much so, very much so. And so it was in about um, 2015 when, you know, I started really looking at, hey, this is, this is working. My students are really responding. They're seeing themselves in their learning. Mm -hmm. We're learning together because, I, you know, I, I didn't grow up knowing the language or the culture. So it was a really, it's an opportunity to create that environment where we all learn together. Sure. Yeah. And so we developed together, my students and I, the Wo'ope Shakoi in the educational setting. Wow. So you're bringing this out of Pine Ridge then and... Wow, isn't that? And then students played a major role in this. They then. did. Yeah. yeah. What What did they contribute to this then? A lot of teaching. Um, like I said, um, we could learn together, and so one of the most powerful things I think uh, my experience as a classroom teacher was not what I could do for my students, but it was quite the opposite. My students became my teachers, and so if I was kind of you know falling off track, or if I was you know moving away from what it meant to be a good relative, mm -hmm. they'd be the first to remind me. So they gave me a lot of feedback. We, uh, we created a lot of our expectations, uh, classroom norms and everything together um, because I really wanted to honor their voices. I didn't want it to be you know, a situation where I was this, this giver of knowledge and this, you know, this really firm um, teacher. Uh, we can get into that on another time, but uh, sure. you know, they, they really helped to develop what uh, an inclusive environment look like. So in some way then, were you asking them, asking these students what they wanted to learn and kind of provided that then? And Yes. Wow. It was very collaborative. Um, um, not to say that it was, you know, uh, streamlined from the beginning. You know, I had a lot of bumps and challenges going into the classroom in the beginning. Um, and so it was really, you know, coming back to those values, especially humility. Um, for me to turn inward and think about, okay, what, what do I need to, to kind of look at differently? Um, what are some of the areas where I need to grow as a person so that we can all be successful together? And so with this type of, I guess, revolution in, in some way in, the, in your classroom setting, then how do the administrators respond to it then with you wanting to kind of develop and, and work on this new project and this new kind of advance, advancement in, in your own classroom setting? They were supportive, yeah. I mean, at Pine Ridge School, you know, we're all about the culture. And so we did our best to, to integrate that in any way, shape, or form that we could. So they were definitely supportive. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, let's see, where, where are we at here? Thank you for sharing all of that, by the way. Um, let's see, tell me about your own experiences in education and or how at your own experiences in education informed your own work then? Um, I think I go back to my own childhood and my own, you know, schooling experiences. You know, I, I saw and I experienced a lot of inequities. Um, and at the time, you know, it really formed a lot about who I was and my identity. Um, I, I didn't have a voice in a lot of the schools and I, you know, when I say that, I, I, I mean the schools that I went to outside of the reservation because I've, I've been to many different schools, um, native and non-native. And uh, that was the constant. I didn't have a voice. A lot of my, my peers didn't have a voice. It was kind of like comply, you know, we had to do what we were told to do. And so we couldn't speak out. And so that really 
informed my decision to become an educator, mm -hmm. as well as my mom's encouragement. You know, my mom and my father are both educators. And so education was definitely, you know, important. Um, it, it seems then like these non-native schools that you were in kind of defined your identity, confined you into a space and time with who you were culturally, and it just left you in this place, yeah. almost like a lonely place. It was very isolating. Let's, uh, let's take a break. Okay. Uh, we'll be back after a short break. Closed captioning for Oyate today is brought to you by Black Hills Energy. Native Sun News has been voted the best weekly newspaper in its class for 2015 by the South Dakota and North Dakota Newspaper Associations. You can find a copy of the Native Sun News at many businesses and vending machines in Rapid City and the surrounding area and on all nine reservations. We publish every Wednesday so advertisers and subscribers can reach our diverse readership by calling 605-721-1266. The Native Sun News covers the other side of the story. You can't predict life's ups and downs. You just give it all you've got to stay on top. But it's easier with a partner like Security First Bank. Since 1898, we've been riding with you through the country's biggest ups and downs. And this is where we'll stay. Security First Bank. A relationship you can count on. Member FDIC. Being connected to him with the earth. Because of the pride. Pride of being Lakota. Look around you and look at your culture. Look at the people who care about you. There is hope. There is always hope. There will always be hope. Suicide isn't the Lakota way. If someone you know needs help, please call 867-HOPE, a public service message from the Lakota Voice Project. If you're talking, they will hear you. Why are we getting killed like this? Kyle's not here. Got caught drinking beer in the park a couple of nights ago. Really? Yeah, zero tolerance. He's out for the season. Harsh. Hey, he knew not to drink. We've made that clear to all of our kids, right? Uh, no, not really. Bill, if we don't tell them what we expect and why they shouldn't drink, how are they gonna know? Talk, they hear you. Hi, welcome back to Oyate Today. Once again, our guest tonight is Ms. Tamara Miyasato, Learning Specialist for the Technology and Innovation in Education. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, thank you for bringing your experience here. It's really neat and interesting to learn that viewpoint about how and, and where we are educationally here in Rapid City in the area, so thank you. Um, we were talking about your experiences as a student and growing up in native and non-native schools and kind of non-native versus native schools in, in somewhat. And so as a teacher now, as an educator, <clears throat> uh, tell me about your, some of your inequities that you experienced as an educator than as a teacher and what you're recognizing and seeing. Wow, that's, that's a really interesting question that I'm glad that you asked because a lot of the inequities that I experienced uh, were similar than you know to my own childhood you know 20 some years before so I felt like not a lot has changed uh, the difference would be um, the inequities that I experienced unfortunately were some inequities that I promoted mm -hmm. so we think about you know our educational system which really hasn't changed much over the past you know 150 plus years mm -hmm. and this time I was coming at it as the teacher and that educational system being so ingrained in in us mm -hmm. I was engaging in a lot of the same, you know, behaviors that isolated me as a student. And so that was really that wake up call my first year back at Pine Ridge, um, realizing like, wow, I have been excluding students. I have been unfair, um, you know, engaging in punitive discipline practices and all of these things that made them feel like they weren't enough or they weren't good enough. Sure. And so it was, you know, a real learning time for me that first year coming home because I had to I had to really look within and examine some hard truths within myself. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, I think it was Christmas break coming home and, you know, kind of crying to my husband like what am I doing? Mm -hmm. 
this is not who I am. This is not the teacher I said I was going to be. You know, we all, <laughs> some of us go into this teaching profession. We've all seen, you know, dangerous minds and stand and deliver. And we think we're going to make this difference and we're going to be this great, awesome teacher. But, you know, you really grow. You really, you know, if you're open to that, that growth process, mm -hmm. you really engage in some self-awareness where you look at some hard truths. Mm -hmm. And the, the next step then is to figure out which direction you're going to take. Are you going to continue to engage in things that aren't necessarily the best for our community? Or are you going to try really hard to, 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 to address those things within yourself so that we can all benefit? And so you went through that break then and you, you realized that you were making or, or, or allowing students to feel how you felt in school way back when, when you were a student, as you had mentioned. Yes. And so with that self-realization and in that kind of realization of, gosh, this isn't who I want to be, what changed for you then? How did you come back that next semester or next after the break there? And, and, and what changed? And what did you start to do to make those changes happen? I came back to the culture. I came back to Wolakota. How do I need to be a good relative? What do I need to change within myself? Mm -hmm. And so when we, we, we began using the Wol Bay, um, that's that was the turnaround point. And people always say, well, where's your data? Show us that this works. Well, I didn't need data because it was a feeling that you could feel when you walked into the room. You know, the kids saw it. I saw it. We were engaging. I changed the curriculum. We, I no longer went by the textbook. Um, it was, as I had said earlier, what do the students need? And they told me. And so together we, we worked and we even um, developed a Tupac curriculum is, is what I call the it. The Tupac? The yeah. Tupac curriculum, yeah. yeah. And so we, um, we worked around informational text and you know read articles and, and uh, watched documentaries about Tupac and we interrogated um, issues that he faced you know, living in um, the city and we, we brought it back to our own community in Pine Ridge. So you were looking at Tupac's life, his lyrics, his songs, his information, his quotes yes. and things and but basically what you're looking at is poverty you're looking at violence, uh, violence and, and inner city struggles Substance abuse. hunger yes. all of that stuff and yes. taking those and applying to mm -hmm. reservation students then but then we also pulled out the wo'ope shakoni the virtues mm -hmm. how did he demonstrate wo'ohitike which is you know bravery and courage and to be disciplined mm -hmm. he did those things and so my students saw that and so it was an awesome way for them to connect not only with their culture but to something that was relevant relevant to their lives, you know, hip hop culture. Mm -hmm. And so it was really successful. So a lot of the students who used to skip my class started coming to class. And so again, I didn't need data to show that, mm -hmm. although I did have the data to show that. <laughs> this is cool because uh, Tupac was demonstrating Wolakota way back in the 90s. Yeah. I wish they taught us that in the 90s when I was in, <laughs> when I was in class. But um, what school? Well, let's talk about the training then. Okay, we're talking about training that you're doing here locally with educators, administrators, and other people in, in these educational uh, institutions. And so what is this training about then? I know you're going out to, to different uh, schools on the reservation, schools here locally. What's this training about then? Well, so the training, as I said, it's it's steeped in the Wo'ope Shakoni. So we look at the framework as the Wo'ope are at the center, these, these laws, these universal laws. But how do we use them to inform or guide trauma-informed practices, culturally responsive teaching, and restorative justice? You know, So again, creating that environment of um, equitable opportunity and inclusivity. And so, um, the, the piece of that that I bring back is the cultural proficiency. It's that turning inward process. It's beginning to change mindsets and really moving away from that traditional educational structure of, um, you know, that model in education really looks at the deficits. We assume that all students are deficient in some way. What can you not do, Richie? Richie, you're not meeting this predetermined level of what I deem to be proficient. but. Cultural proficiency now kind of takes and flips that model and we look at the strengths that the students bring into the classroom. You know, we know that our students have these rich, um, they call it cultural funds of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So what do they know? What do they bring into the classroom? How do we kind of meet their needs based on what they already know? 
Sure. And then also we know that a lot of our kids come from, you know, trauma experiences and that's not just on reservations or in, you know, low SES communities. It's everywhere. We've all experienced trauma. And so how do we then adapt to fit the needs of a student who might be in trauma? Sure. Yes. And let's say uh, I was a teacher here locally in Rapid City. Mr. Richards at elementary A or middle school B or whatever the case may be. So Mr. Richards comes to your training. What do you, what do you hope that I take back to my classroom then by going through your training? What, what does Mr. Richards take back to his students? I like calling myself Mr. Richards, by the way. <laughs> anyway. Well, Mr. Richards, what you would likely take away from my training, I would hope, is just a different way of viewing how you already run things, how you already operate as an educator. Mm -hmm. So um, it's taking that that level of awareness. Sometimes the teachers don't even have an awareness of what trauma is, how it impacts, or might not have an awareness of how to intentionally bring culture into the classroom and how, you know, what strategies can you use to do those things? Because I talk about that intention. It's all about the intention. We're culturally responsive teachers every day, but we're teaching from the culture of dominant society. Our students see, um, you know, white middle class in media on, you know, in their books, on billboards. So we automatically culturally responsive teach. Sure. Um, but now how do we do this with intention to make sure that all of those other different cultures and um, ethnicities and experiences are represented. So I would give you kind of tools to, to interrogate what you're currently doing and then now how can we switch that and again bringing it back to the intention. That's awesome. Uh, let's take a quick break. Uh, Mrs. Miyasato and Mr. Richards will be back right after this. What's he doing? But he can't. <laughs> Look at him. It's just not done. Please, sir, I want some more. More? 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 Please, sir. He has asked for! Thank you. What? Well, he did say please. Sir? Yes, he did. And thank you. Yeah, and thank you. He's a wonderful boy. <laughs> I do like the boy. Please, and thank you. Pass it on. And thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I used to think news is news. It's all the same. But it's not. There's a big difference between local broadcast news and cable news. See, local stations are part of my community, connecting me to local news, weather, and sports on every device. It makes sense. Get the news from the people I trust who actually live here. No agenda, no bias, like on cable, shout shows, or social media. Just facts. For news I can trust, I stay local. Support your local stations. Text TV to 52886 today. When discrimination happens in our community, and it does happen, then it's time to stand up and speak out to make it stop. Discrimination hurts and excludes. We can be better than that. People of Black Hills have a connection to each other, and none of us deserve discrimination. The Rapid City Human Relations Commission can help with discrimination issues in housing, employment, and public accommodations. And each of us, when we see it or hear it, can do our part to end discrimination. You have a responsibility to stand up and speak out. Hi, welcome back to Oyate Today. Once again, our guest tonight is Ms. Tamara Miyasato. Thank you so much for being here. This has been a good show, and uh, I really appreciate you, what you're doing for our community, definitely. So thank you. It shows uh, great leadership, so I'm just impressed with your work. Um, okay, so we talked about the educators. We talked about the teachers and the information that's shared with them and, and taking that back to the classroom then. And so how do we know that students are capable of understanding that or receiving that or being receptive to that then? Um, I think the question should actually be how will we not know they're capable if we don't give them that chance? Mm -hmm. That's, you know, I, you know, going into the classroom, we again, traditional educational models, it's the teacher that knows everything, you know, and you're just gonna listen and learn. But as I said, our kids have so much experience that, you know, they were my teachers and they are so capable. 
you know, we talk about um, culturally responsive teaching and a, a, a piece of that is having high expectations. If we raise the bar uh, for our students, they will rise to meet that challenge. And I've seen it happen so many times in my classroom. You know, at the time, some of my students were thinking, God, Mia Sato, she's so hard, she's so, you know, demanding. But later and at some point they do realize, oh, I know why she's doing that. Look what I can achieve. Mm -hmm. um, my students have been my greatest teachers. And even recently I was speaking with a former student of mine. She graduated a couple years ago and she just had a baby. She was kind of, you know, being a little down on herself. And she was saying, well, who's going to take me seriously? I had a baby right out of high school. Mm -hmm. And so I had to encourage her because she was one of my brightest students. And uh, after a couple of very just, you know, surface level encouragement words, she said to me, she said, wow, you know, you're right. I can still build an empire with a baby on my hip. Awesome. And I was thinking <laughs> to have that, you know, foresight, to have that courage at her age, I, I didn't have it, but it's it's just knowing that our kids are capable and just giving those opportunities to think through things and to show what they're capable of. She's been a teacher, she's still a teacher. Wow, that's sweet, that's awesome. It, it, just from visiting with you and talking with you over the course of this program, it almost seems like what I'm gaining, what I'm kind of understanding is that our education system as it currently sits is almost plateaued and it seems like students aren't getting enough from what is being shared within the classroom and this kind of expansion or this kind of new way of, uh, of thinking and doing things is, is really taking them to another level and, and uh, I'm just getting that and I just wanted to throw that out there for you but um, what are some of the challenges of presenting this type of training then to students and educators, I mean excuse me, to educators, teachers, to principals and whoever else may have been involved with this? Um, I think the greatest challenge would probably be um, mindsets you know, there's a lot of mindsets that aren't necessarily ready to embrace this kind of work. Mm -hmm. You know, we're living in very challenging times right now. You know, we see those challenges every single day. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I mean, working with people who aren't ready to embrace the mindset, I mean, I don't want to approach it like it's impossible mm -hmm. um, because I have worked um, with people who initially aren't ready and I always joke in my trainings, I, you know, I can't pull you by the hair and drag you along this journey. You know, you're on your specific place in this journey for whatever reason. And so I've also had the same educators come back to me, you know, weeks or months later and say, I've thought a lot about this. Now what's the next step? And so um, I just continue doing the work. Uh, I try not to do it from a place of blame or shame, um, pointing fingers, um, because I understand that the more I do that, you know, regardless of my own experiences um, with oppression and marginalization, the more I point the finger and blame, it just makes the work that much harder to do. Definitely. That's met with resistance. Definitely. And how can we get a hold of you then? How can we bring this program into our own schools? Um, you can reach uh, the Thai office or just go to our website, which is www.thai.net. And you can um, either give us a call or my staff page is there. So there's a list of my trainings and um, the things that I do and can offer. Tamara, I want to thank you so much for everything you're doing for our community. Uh, and uh, it's been an awesome show. And thank you so much for sharing this. Um, and, and, uh, and with the message of change is good. So I really appreciate that as well. I want to thank our producers. I want to thank our sponsors. I want to thank Prairie Edge for hosting our show tonight. And I want to thank you for making Oyate today a part of your night. You've been watching Oyate Today, brought to you by Native Sun News Today.